Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator tonight, um, Michael Choi. He is a senior fellow at McKenzie Global Institute. Um, as you, can, you saw the report on, the, on your seat, um, it, it was freshly published just two weeks ago, and he's one of the person who did it. And I'm not gonna read his bio because it is written here, but he is the head of the research that, um, he researched on the impact information technology, such as WebTO and Internet of Things. Um, what's not in here is he was a delinquent graduate student. Instead of writing his um, dis dissertation, he was a part of the city government. And um, he, the way he chooses his academic topics, academic paper, is by the songs that he likes or his teacher likes. So if you can see here, it says, haven't found what I'm looking for. You, you can tell what song that is. <laughs> Um, he is a very busy person. He started his day today at 5.30 Eastern Time in Toronto. So I hope he's not going to fall asleep during the presentation. I'm kidding. He won't. <laughs> but, and, but he is very active. He cannot wait to go skiing this weekend. So please join me to welcome Michael. All right. Thank you all. I am. Appreciate that intro. Let me see if I can find my presentation up here somewhere. Please stay tuned. I have a PhD in computer science, not in PowerPoint. <laughs> Thought that was a question, but that's actually a camera. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, there are a few seats down here if uh, those of you who are standing would like to take a seat. Uh, I want to also thank uh, VLab, who, um, as volunteers, have done a tremendous job. Uh, actually, I, I, in speaking with some of the panelists, they said this is the most professional pre uh, preparation we've ever had for a forum. So really appreciate uh, everything that everyone has done here in terms of hosting this event. Um, hopefully this, this sound is just fine. So let me um, start off with uh, uh, a, a few comments and play a little game here uh, based on a, 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 a movie line. So does anyone recognize the following movie line? Uh, Hello, Mr. Nakamoto. Welcome back to The Gap. <laughs> People familiar with this, right? This is from the movie Minority Report, 2002. Um, and, and one of the things that we discovered as we've been doing this research on Internet of Things uh, is that really the future is becoming the present. It's actually quite interesting. You know, Chris Pister started talking about, uh, you know, smart dust almost 10 years ago now, right? About a year before this uh, movie was uh, released. And so, you know, the idea of billboards that would sense the person who was looking at them and then change their content based on who was in front of them was you know, a, a piece of science fiction. Well, now those products are actually being sold, right? So there's a, a set of billboards which actually can determine through a camera uh, you know, the, the gender, rough age, and number of people who are in front of it, and then thereby change the content that it shows. Um, in healthcare, you know, hopefully not many of us have had to deal with either you know, a colonoscopy, uh, uh, a fiber in a place you don't want to talk about. But <laughs> wouldn't it be better if you could just take a pill and it would you know, take pictures of the, your GI tract you know, rather than undergoing a very unpleasant uh, medical procedure? Well, it turns out these pills actually exist. It's, it's actually a competitive market for these sorts of pills. These are pills that have a camera in them, LED lights, uh, a, a battery, uh, an RF transmitter, and actually takes thousands of pictures as you ingest this pill and it goes through your system, right? And these are all examples of what happens when you can uh, incorporate sensors, actuators into physical objects and make the physical world part of an information system. And so that's the Internet of Things. Of course, there are other you know, terms for this. People use M to M. We actually don't use the machine to machine language. Um, so to speak, uh, because we actually think in some of these examples or some of these applications uh, that the human is an important part of the loop. So, uh, you know, we, we decided to use the Internet of Things moniker. So with that being said, as, as why, why is this important now? Why are these business applications actually coming to the fore now? And I'm just going to frame up a, a, a few um, different types of uh, applications, understand why it's happening now, and then potentially some applications for those of you who are entrepreneurs. Who's an entrepreneur in the room? About 80% maybe? I might be exaggerating. All right, just a few quick trends, right? Number one, why is this happening now? Sensor, sensors are just getting better, cheaper, smaller, uh, and, and faster, right? And more plentiful. So that's number one, point number one. Point number two is networks are everywhere. So increasingly, I wouldn't call networks, particularly wireless networks, 
uh, ubiquitous, but certainly pervasive. So they don't cover every square inch of the world, but they cover a high percentage of where people are at least. So again, networks are becoming quite pervasive. And then finally, our ability to analyze the tremendous amount of data that these network sensors generate and to be able to control these actuators is greatly increasing, partly because there's stuff in the cloud, the ability to store, you know, still 60% uh, CAGR in terms of uh, storage being deployed. So that's why this trend is really starting to accelerate and, and achieve, you know, business value and, you know, move from the realm of science fiction to, you know, real businesses. And we'll talk about some of those real businesses today. So as we looked at all of these, uh, you know, it's funny, when we released this report, uh, Kara Swisher said, well, here's the McKinsey report, and those guys, they like to organize things. And that's actually true. We do like to organize things. So we, we uh, discovered six categories of applications for Internet of Things, which we use um, you know, with our clients and others to help understand you know, where the, what the realm of possibility might be. And hopefully these might be helpful to you as well. Um, two big categories that, that, you know, under the six. One is information analysis. This is primarily taking information from the sensor networks. And then automation and control. This is when you close the loop back to changing the physical world. I'll quickly run through these. These are all detailed in the report that you have on your seats. So, first one, tracking behavior. This is simply using the Internet of Things to track objects, people, perhaps even data uh, through space and time. So whether or not it's using a... Uh, um, a transponder within a car to price insurance based on how somebody drives rather than gross demographic factors like age and gender and location, uh, or whether or not it's, it's augmented reality applications where knowing what's in the camera as well as the location of a, a, a mobile phone can give you all kinds of new you know, location-based services. Enhanced situational awareness. This is real-time awareness of the physical world augmented through the use of sensor networks. So this could be everything from you know, a, a shot spotter figuring out where gunfire is coming from. You know, it, unfortunate that this is, this is the case. When I present this example to Europeans, they're all like, well, you Americans are nuts, but uh, it's a real case. Uh, but, uh, you know, other examples could be a, a logistics manager who actually suddenly understands the weather across a continent and can better route uh, um, uh, shipments rather than, you know, having to do a, analysis in a much less powerful way. The third one really is less about real time, but really using these sensor networks in order to make longer, medium to long term decisions. It could be everything from remote health monitoring, and we might you know, discuss a little more about that now, but obviously knowing over time as someone goes through their day uh, how their symptoms are evolving rather than just having a, a couple of point measurements when someone comes to the doctor's office can make a big difference in making sure that you actually make the right diagnosis and, and apply the right therapies. Then when you close the loop into automation and control, first category is process optimization. This is using the Internet of Things in order to improve processes or which are in closed systems. So it could be anything from a factory, assembly line, et cetera, where actually nowadays we don't, in typical, even very highly automated factories, do a lot of sensing and figure out where pieces are or what conditions are within a reactor. Um, to really interesting examples such as uh, deep sea oil wells, where you know, tremendous pressure, tem tremendous temperature, Sometimes when you're pumping oil, it actually has the equivalent of a, a water hammer effect, just like in your shower, which is not good when you have a lot of oil uh, flowing through one of these things. And so being able to sense when the viscosity of oil is changing and, and change the, uh, uh, the pumping frequency so that you don't actually have a rupture or some other terrible thing happen uh, can actually uh, prevent a, reduce a lot of risk and prevent a lot of loss. Second category under automation and control is optimized resource consumption. We all know that... Um, you know, carbon emissions is a big deal, energy reduction is a big deal, and so applying these sensors uh, as well as being able to close the loop to change, you know, either where load is applied within a data center or more broadly in a smart grid application is obviously a, a leading uh, application of these technologies. And then finally, complex autonomous systems. These are the most complex, the most arguably far out applications, but ones in which you have uh, autonomous control in you know, relatively uh, open and unconstrained and complex situations, everything from uh, automobile driving to uh, um, you know, squadrons of, of uh, uh, unmanned vehicles. So those are six categories. Uh, let me just quickly, uh, you know, finally, and, and, and wrap up with you know, a description. It's one of the simplest architecture diagrams you'll ever see. Right? Uh, three big categories, things that are 
observing the physical world, the thing that goes on in the middle, and then changing the physical world. Right? So first aspect, not every as part of the Internet of Things has to come from physical sensors. Right? So some of it, from number one, will actually come from data sources which are networked. Uh, these are traditional databases. Right? Secondly, there are a set of sensors which can exist within the world and, and are connected through uh, networks and often in mesh form. The third aspect of the, of the, of the uh, architecture is aggregation. You've got to make sure that the data eventually gets to the analytics. The fourth one is the analytics. Right? They're, they're computing resources and storage that allow you to do interesting things. The fifth one, again, is where the human might be incorporated into the loop. So if you think about the situational awareness application, <coughs> being able to visualize or you know, take all of this data and make it usable by a person is extremely important. And then finally, the ability to close the loop and actually, in some applications, uh, affect the world through closed loop act actuation. So let me just run through just some ideas, right? This is just making stuff up for people who are uh, in the room and, and have different um, uh, you know, interests or, or abilities or you know, so, uh, some entrepreneurial applications. So if you are a physical sensor or actuation person, right, a MEMS person, a materials person, someone who you know, knows low power, you might be, want to play in sensors or actuation. Um, you might be someone who has access to a bunch of unique data, which would be very interesting if it were fused with physical data, right? So it's geolocation, metadata about people or objects. You might be able to play here. If you're an embedded computing person, you know about low power stuff, right? And you know about uh, real-time systems. You might play in the sensor space, you might play in the aggregation space, you might play in the, the actuation space. Um, you might be a networking person, right? You might know wireless, mesh stuff, right? Know about something about security or discoverability of objects, uh, ID and authentication. Um, I just had an interesting uh, discussion with Anant over, uh, over dinner about some of the, the, the security challenges or, or, or uh, in, in his business, right? But again, you could play in the aggregation space or, or discover an ID. You might actually be someone who knows how to deal with big data. Um, you might be deploying stuff in the cloud. Uh, you might be able to do things in real time with a tremendous amount of data streams. The analytics place might be where you, you can play. Those of us, I mean, I used to be an HDI guy. If you know how to do user experience stuff, uh, multimodal interfaces could become increasingly important with this deluge of data. You might play in visualization. And finally, there are complete system providers, often vertically oriented. And you might play across the entire space, but that means you have to know a lot about a lot of different things. And with that, I'm going to introduce Anant, who is actually a part of a complete systems provider, uh, a co-founder and director and head of sales and marketing, I believe, for Cantaloupe Systems in Berkeley. So with that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I start, I wanted to set the expectation a little bit, if I can find. Uh, when Anoop called me um, and told me about <clears throat> the VLAB, I thought he was asking me to speak at the, the VLAB uh, Internet of Things conference, and I thought, yeah, sure, that sounds like fun, and I hung up. And then the next feedback I got was, well, that was really just an invitation for an interview process. <laughs> so, <laughs> took me a little bit of a surprise. I actually started to get slightly nervous, but I was like, all right, we, we could do this. And I was on the road somewhere in a hotel room going through an interview process with people I've never met, um, getting asked a lot of hard questions. And so I was like, okay, I think I, think I did pretty well, and I'm, I feel like I'm back in college at this point. And, uh, and I think like two days later, they're like, that was great. Um, I think we need a second round of interviews. <laughs> At this point, I'm kind of freaking out. And, <clears throat> and we go to the second center interviews, but what was the real kicker is when they showed me all the bios for all of our experts here at the panel, and I was like, I need to kind of spruce up our bio. Actually, Anoop, you suggested you need to add some more flavor to the, bi to the bio. <laughs> and so I've never been nervous talking to people before, but you know, if you don't like my presentation today, blame their diligence process, <laughs> all right? So just setting the expectation. Um, and just to just spend a couple minutes here just talking about Cantaloupe Systems, which is my company and my co-founder, Mandi Barora, who's also in the audience. Uh, we've grown to about 38 people at our company now, and our focus is what Michael was alluding to, complete systems, end-to-end. -end. Uh, our focus right now is the vending channel. To be honest, when we started the company, uh, we were hoping to be able to do lots of different channels. 
uh, because we were looking at the M2M space at the time and there seemed to be a lot of opportunities, but vending kind of sucked us in. So if you're entrepreneurs in there and you're looking to go into other markets, uh, our advice was uh, focus on one and make it work. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, we currently focus on the US. Uh, we also have business in Canada, Mexico, and Australia. Uh, we're doing some diligence in Europe and Japan as well. Um, but all very hard markets to crack. Um, we've gotten a bunch of different awards over the years. I'll, I'll kind of let them speak to themselves. Um, just kind of track record. We started the company uh, while we were still students at UCLA. And <clears throat> when the, uh, actually I'll get into that later, but kind of our financial backing, we really bootstrapped the company for the first few years. Um, Mandeep grew up in a small business family, so did I. And so we really kind of had inherently just, you know, we've got to prove ourselves before we ask anyone for money kind of concept. And so we really bootstrapped it. And, um, you know, about 2005, we did, a, we did a friends and family round earlier to kind of help things going. And then in 2005, we did a Series B round with uh, Global Environment Fund, which is a fund out of Washington, D.C. And they've been phenomenal partners of ours. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we closed our Series C uh, for about $12.4 million. And that was with Foundation Capital, who I believe is a sponsor for this that I did not know about, and also with our current investor, GEF. And our, a lot of our growth really happened over the last year. And 2010, we're kind of hoping to double uh, what we did in 2009. So, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people raise their hands when asked who's an entrepreneur in this room. And I guess all of you probably have various reasons why you started your companies. Uh, Mandeep and I started, wanted to start a company because at the time, everyone was doing it. Everyone was getting the dates because they started a company. Everyone was getting profiled in magazines because they started a company. And so we were like, hey, we kind of know small business. You know, when they do computer science, I did electrical engineering. Let's, let's try to figure something out. So that's kind of the main reason why we started looking at doing something. And we really wanted to focus on various aspects, um, things that were hot at the time. This is like 1998 to 2003, right? So Internet Bubble was bursting towards the end. Uh, but before it burst, we were still trying to do this, and hardware is great, software systems are great. Um, we loved wireless, we liked the concept of wireless. Um, internet was booming, and SaaS was a relatively new concept at the time, but it made a whole lot of sense to us uh, when we started the company. So we're like, if we're gonna do something, these are the kinds of ingredients we wanna have. Um, really the vision was, you know, we were looking at M2M, which stands for machine to machine, but really, how do we use a wireless internet to improve asset utilization? And it's an interesting concept, the internet of things and, and all the different things that can come under that, but our focus really was you have these industries out there, you know, in our case, vending machines or trucking or parking meters or anything where there's it's just a physical infrastructure that's been built with an existing business model with people who've had jobs, two generation jobs kind of thing. How do we go in there and show them how they can get even more value out of their existing infrastructure uh, just by leveraging wireless technologies, internet technologies, software systems? So those are, that was really kind of our vision. And really the other big piece of it is the um, reason why we chose vending is because Manib's family is ingrained in the vending industry. They are distributors in the industry. And so, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Aurora, who are also in the audience, they you know, I said we bootstrapped the thing. They, we really did. We lived in their house. They fed us. They sheltered us after college. Um, we built our first devices in a garage. Um, that being said, it was a pretty nice garage. It's not like that barnyard that HP's got. But um, it was... <laughs> It was, uh, you know, living with them for a year and a half where their one requirement was eating dinner with them every night. Uh, initially, it was kind of awkward, but it uh, turned out to be one of the best things we could have done because every night, we learned a whole lot about the vending industry. And their customers, who they sell products to, were going to be our customers that we were going to try to sell to. So just understanding the politics, the dynamics, who the players are, you know, who's got money, who doesn't, all that kind of stuff. Um, we learned, and for me, it was a massive crash course in vending, which I didn't even think about vending much before all this happened. Um, so that was a big uh, leverage point. So a lot of people say, you know, if you're buying real estate, buy where you know. I fundamentally believe the same thing about business. Do business where you know or have people that you can trust inherently that know the business as well, and then add value to that industry. And so why did we start? Well, we decided to basically, we, to be honest, we really didn't know what we were doing, but we decided to connect a vending machine to the internet, start getting some data, and just kind of see where it went from there. And uh, a lot of our early clients really, 
you know, took a liking to it. They're like, well, do this with the data, do that with the data, you know, build a system that does this. But the fact that we were able to do uh, kind of this connectivity piece of it with off-the-shelf components for the most part um, really kind of gave us some hope that we can kind of take keep taking this forward. Um, so I'll talk about, you know, we got a, what, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? So in vending, uh, a vending machine, there's four downstairs that does not have our stuff on it yet. But um, <laughs> there's six million vending machines in the U.S. There's about 13, 14 million globally. All of them are unconnected. And people that own those vending machines, there's probably three to 400 major companies. Major companies define five to 40 million a year. It doesn't get bigger than that. And then you have Pepsi and Coke, which is the two big units. And so uh, what's consistent across the board is that they're basically running a little store, convenience store, without really any insight into what's going on there. So it's all guesswork. It's all historical. The best drivers are the ones they've had for 20 years that know the routes. Um, it's, it's that kind of business model. So you know, they've got to guess how much money is in the machine. They have to guess if the machine is empty. They're guessing if the machine is even working in the first place. And customer retention issues, which is probably the biggest sticking point, is you know, you open the yellow pages, there's 30 different vending companies you can pick from. There's nothing that differentiates these companies because it's a box, they provide service, that's about it. Um, and, you know, if you showed up two days late and it was out of stock and your client was irate that day, it's just going to kick you out and bring someone else in. And so how do we resolve these issues is, is one of the first set of things we saw. Um, we also saw the vending model. I mentioned, you know, there's these, there's these companies that... Um, they have accountability issues, but scale. They can't grow past 40, 50 million because they just don't have the systems to do it. And there's no transparency in the business model, which I will get into right here. Um, just real quick, so the idea is that's the consumer. That's you going to a vending machine. That's the driver that goes to the vending machine. And that's the vending company that owns the driver and the machine. So initially, consumer goes to the machine. Driver fills the machine. This is data from the consumer all the way back to the owner gets there, it's gone through a few different layers, and usually they don't have very good IT systems to track any of this stuff. Customer gets pissed off because it ate their dollar. Everyone has probably gone through that process. They call the operator directly. That's when they get direct interfacing with the customer, and it's all about putting out fires at that point. Where we came into the play is, is can we connect the vending machine directly to the owner? And all of a sudden now, you have a system where the customer doesn't get bad service because the operator has proactively gone to the machine as soon as it broke down to fix it. They've gone to the machine as soon as it's gone out of stock to, to replenish it. The other thing about transparency, you put money into the machine, driver takes the machine, he pockets some of it, <laughs> right? And now the operator's left with something called shrink. And so how do you resolve that issue? Um, again, if you're connected to the machine, you know exactly how much money is in there. What we found out in our, in, our, in our progression in the industry, when they have clients like Lowe's or even like the business school here that has vending machines, these accounts get commissions from the operators. And so the operator, because they're getting stolen from, they then underreport their sales to a Lowe's or Stanford Business School or all that kind of stuff. So again, we continued developing our software systems, continued building our network, and connected them, and give them access to the same data too. Let's make everyone honest in the equation. And that was really the idea. Um, Michael, what your point was, all the different layers, all the different things companies can do in this space. When we got into it, the companies that were inventing the technology companies, they were, and they were old. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, they were slow. The software systems were not SaaS, were not internet-based. So we kind of had to build everything from scratch. So we built the hardware layer, which is a device that goes in the machine. We connected to the different networks out there, AT&T, all that stuff. We also did a local RF, so machines locally can talk to each other. We had to build all that ourselves. We then built our software system. So you have, we do all SaaS stuff. Um, how do you use that data? How do you use that data on a day-to-day -day operational basis without getting buried in reports? And that's really where our focus is on SaaS. What we found is you start working with bigger vending companies, they have accounting systems and stuff you have to integrate with. We had to build an entire team that just focused on doing integration services. And then the last piece, which we think is going to be the big kicker for our competitive advantage in the marketplace, is building a consulting team. We're now the wireless experts in vending. So we should have people that can go into our clients and help them implement, deploy quickly, so they can see the payback as quickly as possible. And our focus right now really is to build our core competencies in that area. Um, this is just a quick payback model. <clears throat> the left side, this, this chart that you're seeing here, kind of shows a typical vending company that's got about 10 routes. 10 routes means they're responsible for about 100 vending machines, so 10 trucks. Um, in this case, the weekly route average was $9,300. We track a metric called fills per visit, is how much product are you loading in the machine 
uh, when you get there. Because the most expensive operational piece of any company has is actually going out to the vending machine. So you want to maximize that. Well, over the last three years particularly, we've been able to prove this out with over the 120 customers that we have, that we can pretty much cut the number of trucks they have in half. And that's just because we eliminate all the guesswork. And for us, Internet of Things means eliminating guesswork. And uh, here's some metrics. Uh, but, but what we're seeing basically, event, the vending industry, like I said, is pretty much your hyper-competitive model. It's the hot dog stand story you hear about in econ class. And there is no competitive advantages, so margins just go down to zero, and you're doing well. That's vending. One to two percent is the industry average. People that are deploying our systems are bumping it up to eight, nine percent uh, on top of that. So this is really where we're getting our wins now and in, in getting into companies and showing them the payback. We wouldn't be uh, a responsible company if we didn't understand what kind of green impact we had in today's age. And so one of the things we started looking at, and really Global Environment Fund who invested in us is the reason why they, they kind of did this, is in the industry there's about 60,000 vending trucks um, putting out 3.46 billion pounds of uh, CO2. That's the vending industry's uh, footprint. And so if I eliminate 50% of that, uh, I eliminate 1.73 billion pounds of carbon dioxide, which if you don't know what that means, that's about planting 31 and a half million trees. So it's a pretty significant impact. There's a lot of other benefits we're just starting to learn about, improved fuel mileage for those trucks that we do have out there, less wear and tear, all that kind of stuff. So there's definitely an angle there. And really the question now is where do we go from here? And like I said earlier, our focus was connect the vending machine and then just kind of keep building and keep building software systems and, and understanding our client's business to impact data with them. Um, well, our focus right now is there's six million, like I said, 14 globally. That's what we're focusing on right now. It's a, it's a big market for us. Um, but then the question is, how do we leverage all these different layers that we've built up and invested into? Um, can we start doing merchandising? So not just telling you what to take to the machine based on a fixed menu, but I can also tell our clients, you know, take out the Snickers and A1 because I'm pretty sure Milky Way is going to sell better. Or, hey, don't charge 75 cents, charge 95 cents because it's not going to hurt your sales. So we're starting to get into those kind of analytics. Um, and then the, you know, the idea is if you, if you have an internet connection to the vending machine, can you put a screen on there? What else can you do with that? Can you make it a kiosk? I mean, kiosks are a whole world of the M2M space that's blowing up right now. And so how do we uh, leverage that internet connection uh, for that? That's vending. How do we go into other industries? Um, our focus, again, is service-based industries, where you have an existing asset base. You've invest The industry has spent money building that base. It's a disruptive model. How do you go in and change their business model with real-time information? Um, so we're exploring, visiting those things. And then, you know, the vending machine itself. Do you really need a $4,000 box that does what it does today if it's connected to the Internet? And, you know, we don't have answers to these questions today. But these are the types of things that we're exploring. So that's it. Thank you, Anant. I don't know if someone has the power to make this go away, but we probably don't need it anymore. Let me introduce the other members of our panel. Uh, Andrew Thompson uh, has spent a career in intelligent medicine focused on expanding global access to care, dramatically increasing the, the value delivered by drugs by leveraging computer technology in healthcare. Uh, he's been involved in companies that have completed successful IPOs or have been acquired by Fortune 100 businesses, including Cell Genesis, uh, Cytotherapeutics, Abgenics, uh, Cardiorhythm, uh, FemRx, North Star Neuroscience, and others. Uh, Andrew Thompson has a, an MA in engineering from Cambridge and an MA in education from here at Stanford. Uh, War Warren Hogarth uh, is a, a VC at Sequoia Capital and focuses on clean tech and energy investments. Prior to joining Sequoia, uh, he completed his PhD in chem uh, at the University of Queensland where he developed uh, fuel cell technology. He was also a Fulbright Scholar to Princeton and a guest scientist at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, Peter Hartwell, who has uh, had his picture in the New York Times recently, uh, leads HP's, HP's uh, team, and not in the HP uh, garage, uh, leads HP's team <laughs> with the uh, carefully uh, constructed acronym Central Nervous System for the Earth, which spells SENSE. Uh, developing a broad sensing system to bring environmental awareness to information technology infrastructure. Uh, Peter has extensive experience in commercializing silicon MEMS products, uh, has a BSE in material science from Michigan, and a PhD in EE from Cornell, and has appeared in the New York Times picture. Remember that. All right. 
Who else, right? Uh, finally, Henry Holtzman is the uh, Chief Knowledge Officer at the MIT, the famous MIT Media Lab. He's been a member of the MIT community since 1981 and the Media Lab since it started in 1985. Uh, he's the Director of the Digital Life Consortium and a Director of the Information Ecology Group and directs, he does a lot of directing, uh, the lab's uh, CE 2.0 collaboration uh, with sponsor companies uh, to formulate principles for a new generation of consumer electronics and was also a founder and CEO and CTO of uh, Presto Technologies, a media lab spinoff uh, that, that, that uh, leveraged the Internet of Things. So welcome to our panel. Let's uh, start off the questioning with Andrew. So uh, as one of the other entrepreneurs uh, on the panel, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, Internet of Things is used within healthcare, um, and then you know what you've learned in terms of Internet of Things uh, in your field. Okay, um, I'm going to talk actually fairly specifically less about Internet of Things in healthcare, and I'll talk about what we do in Internet of Things because uh, I think I'm most qualified to talk about that. Um, I think what Anand said, uh, he used a phrase which I, I think is really good actually. He said, Internet of Things is about eliminating guesswork, and that is what we do. Uh, our company uh, has developed a set of technologies that enable us to uh, link medicine to your mobile phone. And the whole idea here is to enable patients and their families to manage their health much better. And the key here is that we're not inventing new therapy. We're actually embedding sensors inside the therapies you already use to make it actually work in the real world. And that may seem like a fairly radical thing, but if you look at the efficacy of most drugs and devices, what you'll discover is that most of them actually don't. And I could go through all kinds of statistics, but if you look at, for example, the world's uh, most uh, valuable medical device market, it's for something called the cardiac defibrillator. And if you're lucky enough to have one of those things, then less than one in 20 of you will get a benefit from having that device implanted. Interesting, it's $30,000 and it costs $30,000 to implant it. So it's very expensive. Very few people get a benefit from this very expensive therapy. Less than 10% of the people who take the world's most prescribed drug, Lipitor, actually get a therapeutic benefit. So this issue of making therapy work in the real world is a very important one. And the keys to that are empowering, em, empowering patients and families, because those are the people who actually do the work in the healthcare system. Doctors don't care of patients, don't take care of patients in between clinic visits. So it's a very important, very high value uh, opportunity. Um, I'll give you one specific example of a, uh, a product that's in clinical trials now so you get a, a sense for what this might look like. Uh, this is a mental health product. Uh, that's a very big, very uh, pervasive problem globally. Um, it's roughly the number two driver in, in, um, uh, of cost in developed health systems. It's probably the number one driver of cost in, in the world in terms of health systems. So this product is for uh, patients who have bipolar disease or schizophrenia. Uh, those patients need to be on an atypical, what's called an atypical antipsychotic, and they need to be on that drug every day. And that's a very tough challenge. So first thing we do is allow them to know and their families to know whether they've taken their medicine. And then we track two other things that are really, really important for these people, typically young, in their 20s when they're first diagnosed, maybe late teens. Their sleep, which is a very sensitive uh, indicator of whether they're likely to have a psychotic break, and their support or sociability. And we do that using the phone. So we track their talking, texting, and moving. And those two index parameters, sleeping and support or sociability, provide us and their, provide the patient and their family with enormous insight into whether the drug is working and whether they need more of it, less of it, or a different product. It's very valuable. So that's the type of product we make. So Anand said that he started his... Uh, started because uh, everyone else was doing it. What, why did you do yours? Uh, okay, so this company was uh, uh, incubated by myself and uh, my business partner. We began in 2001. Uh, we spent uh, 20 plus years working in uh, technology-based healthcare companies in Silicon Valley. And when you start a healthcare company, you have to think about where the world is going to be roughly seven years after you start the company because that's how long it takes to build a healthcare product. Uh, we made um, two bets very sort of simple bets at the time we started this company. One, uh, if you do retail healthcare inflation at 10% or 12% or 8% or some number, you get to a percentage of the US GDP that is totally unsustainable and the system we thought would hit the buffers around now would hit the buffer. So that's a simple bit of math that you didn't have to be too clever, I don't think, to think about. So we thought, okay, well, people are going to have to start to build products that are definitely outside the asylum. 
right? Meaning what we do now is absolutely lunatic. We're the richest country in the world. We spend $8,000 for every man, woman, and child living in this country every year on health care. And it's very good, but it's absolutely unaffordable. So that has to change. And the other bet we made is that the technology framework or structure that has completely remade every other industry on the planet is called mobile computing and the internet. Wonder what we could do with that in healthcare. That's it. That's reasonable reasoning, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Not if I could ask you, actually, uh, you, a great presentation. What's the most surprising thing you found? I mean, you've discovered a lot of interesting things as you've been running this business, but. Um, I, <clears throat> it's so, you know, my experience and my partner's experience, we uh, didn't really have any experience. So pretty much the last seven years, <laughs> anything that we've had to deal with may be a surprise to, to people that are more experienced, but it's just really been just another challenge. Um, I think one of the, the big things that we had known a little bit better is the client base, um, our customers, the industry itself, uh, didn't know how poor it was. And so doing things like this does require an investment on their side. And one of the challenges is they get the payback, you know, it's a, it's a nice car to buy, but I just don't have the money for it. So how do you resolve those issues? And those are things that we're working on. Super. So thinking of investing, so Warren, <laughs> you're someone who uh, a lot of people probably would, would like you to have make an investment decision about. Uh, you probably see hundreds, if not more, uh, business plans cross your desk. Um, what does it take to, to get your attention? Because you probably go through them pretty quickly. Well, um, <clears throat> so I think you know one of the the best things you could do is listen very closely to the two entrepreneurs to my right and to the words that were coming out of their mouth about how they were describing the value to the consumer that they were providing. I think that's the thing that you know matters most at the end of the today. At the end of the day for us, it's is there a is there a big market, and will the consumer be willing to buy or, or pay in? So. Um, with all due respect to the vending industry, it's not necessarily the most sexy, sexy space uh, around, but you know you can deliver real value with technology, which you know in this case is a few years old. You didn't need, uh, you know, today you don't need to wait necessarily for the cutting edge technology to come in, but there's value there today. And an interesting, another interesting piece I would say of their business, something to think about at least, is to what aspects of the business do you want to own? Do you want to own the hardware? Do you want to own the software? or do you want to comp uh, provide a complete service? On the hardware side of things, I would really recommend if you're chasing that space, it needs to be very disruptive. Because if it's not, it's at the end of the day, it's a commodity business. A lot of the devices that people are using today in this space, you know, they're manufactured uh, by Huawei or a number of different people in China or around the world, and they're very low gross margin businesses. They're coming down a very rapid cost curve. So to go to the point of shooting five years ahead in time, you're going to have to shoot for a very low price point. I'm not saying there aren't opportunities there. I think there definitely are. So if it's not disruptive, then focus on all of the different verticals where things could be interesting. And so we're not smart enough or, or have the, the foresight, but we see a lot of different things in many verticals. Right now, I'm looking at something in Smart Grid. One of my partners is looking at something in the customer service space. Again, something that's actually been tried in the past, but there's a few new sort of innovations uh, or, or tweaks on the model um, from a services point of view that we can we think can deliver real value and and what's important is the entrepreneur has gone out they've got two customers in sort of a trial of beta they've bootstrapped the company this is a pretty simple space um, and it's a very simple it's a solution as well where you drop dollars to the bottom line at the end of the day for the customer so um, you know I, I would just say in reiterating those points that either on, from the technology point of view you know it really has to be disruptive and provide sort of a solution that sort of isn't available uh, today if you are going to go down that path. Or think of a sort of a complete so, um, solution in a vertical. Go out and really test that with the customer. Like Anand said, you know, um, some of the biggest lessons they learned were through, you know, working with his co-founders, parents and stuff who knew the, the industry, who knew the business. They had to go out there and, 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 and prove it to the customer. And now they're, they're being very successful. Warren, well, you, see, you see proposals in a, a lot of different domains and businesses, are there specific value propositions around Internet of Things which, you know, really strike you in terms of um, being quite attractive? Well, again, I'd say that it's very industry specific, but if I were to say what sort of a bit of a why now, which is another question to, to sort of ask yourselves and why we're very excited about this space, uh, one of the big 
challenges hasn't been the cost of um, you know, the device at the end of the day, it's been the cost of supplying the solution. So if you were uh, AT&T, for example, and you provided the network, you, you, you built your network to, um, for cell phones and for cell phone plans. So you had a, an ARPU or an average revenue per user of maybe $50 per month. Your cost of running that system might have been $10, $10 a month with billings and everything that's, that are in that system, plus the plans that you have and you provided were all built for the data and the service that you know, is there for mobile phones. The problem is with many of these applications, whether it be vending, you know, if you're to charge $50 a month, it just doesn't work. Um, you know, if you're doing a smart meter business, you need to be able to charge, you know, pay a dollar a month for the data. And so what's, what's happening now and some of the disruptions that we're seeing are changes within the network. As networks change and um, as, as platform companies come through, and, and you know, we've got one in this space called Jasper Wireless, which comes through and, you know, they believe that they can deliver this service profitably for both the carrier and for themselves, where, you know, they can, uh, um, the companies can survive off that sort of ARPU of the one, two, three dollars per month. So I wouldn't say that, you know, it sort of redirected what you said a little bit because there's a lot of different areas that are interesting to us and I'm, I'm not ha narrowing in on any one because there's so many that we, that we come to and we would have never thought of vending, but I mean, it's a great business and the value proposition is there. Um, I would just say what's exciting to us is as we see these disruptive changes coming in, as this can be provided by an order of magnitude cheaper, the solution, we think there's going to be a lot of different areas open up. And, you know, whether it be, you know, the next level of sort of smart meters, uh, co two companies we invested in last year, you know, one was eCardio, which does cardiac monitoring devices, and, you know, another one was eMeter, which is the software layer looking at the meter data management. We, we screwed up. Uh, about 13, 14 years ago when we invested in an AMR company or advanced meter reading company. It was like 15 years before the time and lots of reasons that it, that it didn't work because we got too far ahead of the market so we make mistakes. So, but what we look most carefully at is that value proposition because all of these verticals are now a possibility. Let me remind everybody about the uh, yellow cards that you have. So as you come up with questions or you actually just want to call a foul on somebody, just use the yellow card. Do we get two of one? Uh -huh. Let me go to Peter. Uh, and not mention that he started in the garage. HP started in the garage. You are no longer in a garage. Um, but you're in uh, well, you know, one of the leading IT companies in the world. Um, but doing Internet of Things work. Can you talk a little bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages of being in part of an organization of that scale? What are you able to do? And what are the things you're, you're focused on? Sure. Um, I suppose the irony is I have to admit that uh, when I started this project at HP, um, I'm fundamentally a sensor guy. I was doing research at HP Labs on, on how to build uh, sensor technologies inside a computer company. So that wasn't really a great fit. They kind of said, hey, um, maybe you should have gone with the Agilent folks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so we call it, when you're working on a project that they tell you not to work on, we actually still call it a G job or a garage job, which is the way we, we, we pay tribute to, to where the company actually started. And um, um, you know, in the end, uh, HP actually bought the garage back about five, six years ago. And if you know what Palo Alto real estate um, costs, we, you have to be a big company to buy the garage <laughs> back in the end. So, but um, it was a G job. Uh, so it started at that point where, um, so even though it is an enormously huge company now, um, I had to really, there's a lot of the entrepreneur spirit that, that folks have been talking about up here, is, is how I had to get this started and get this moving inside the big company. But what we found is that the, the, so we, we talked about the components and being commoditized. I had developed a, a widget, a um, thousand times better than anything on the market, but it was still a widget um, in terms of performance. And so what did you do with it? And it wasn't until we started to look at the system and look at the solution space and actually figure out how it was going to impact the customer's business that I could finally get the bigger company to start listening to me. What we found was, was this um, central nervous system of the earth required kind of a, a lot of the same components that... Uh, that were on, on the slide up there on, on all the things, even down to the consulting layer at the bottom. Those actually existed across HPs. We were able to, to put the pieces together and actually vertically integrate a solution inside the big company. So I guess the, the, the trade-off was um, you know, we had all these pieces inside the company. If we could just figure out how to put those together. And so we, we took our little solution creation services team and focused them inside instead of outside and built a solution. But it wasn't until 
You know, I saw a quote today somewhere that said it's the system stupid. Um, because because you have to look at where, where the value is that makes business sense for you and what actually is the answer what's going to what's impact um, your customer. And what this really is about here is it's, it's, it's in, even in the vending machine example, it's about creating the information that lets people run their business more efficiently. And if you're the vending company, you don't actually want to think about all the things in the food chain that have to happen. You don't want to deal with a wireless carrier now associated with your vending machine. Let somebody else handle all that. Let's just get the data, get the information. That actually makes our business run better. What are the opportunities for an entrepreneur or a smaller company to interface with what you're doing at HP? So or I, general big companies. Yeah, it's and you know I think the the there there are a lot of spaces where where we don't have the expertise and so the the first company or that partner for our um, central nervous system for the earth is actually Shell Oil and so for all the expertise we know how to build a wireless sensor network together from building the sensor through the data collection the networking um, um, analyzing the data the high performance computing to the service play at the end and the software stack. Hold up, we know nothing about exploring oil. I've learned more in the last six months about exploring oil that you really don't want to know about how to explore. It's terribly complicated, like we were talking about. Well, well pressures, I think you actually talked about um, um, earlier, so we are learning about oil tonight. Um, but it's, it's about finding that partner you need that actually to bring in that last bit of expertise to, to, to get you into a space that you're not familiar with. Um, um, I think you know the comment earlier was on um, be comfortable and understand your market, and maybe those are the people um, that help you get into those spaces. And then there's a lot of technologies that come off the shelf these days, and maybe the reason, you know, since Chris first started talking about smart best, this hasn't happened, is that there are still technical challenges that haven't been solved yet. Um, but you, so you have to look at the places where your expertise can, can carve out a piece of that pie. And I think we do have to partner. We, we have most of the solution, but there's a lot of places we still need to partner. People know how to get to Warren because he's in the business of taking, you know, proposals, et cetera. How do you get to somebody like you inside a huge company? Other than here, which you guys all have great access to right now. So, um, from my, I had to look at it from the other side, which is, which is how do I, um, how do I tell people that I need help? So get your picture in the New York Times, and, and then your inbox fills up incredibly with, with a lot of opportunities. But um, you'd be surprised what a cold call can do if you can actually have a name and push it to the right place. And so I literally, I get to answer emails. God, this is going to be horrible tomorrow. But um, <laughs> um, you go to hp.com, and at the bottom there is a tell us what you think button and and they somebody will answer those emails that's just the way our company handles it so um, they all come to my desk some of them if you put sensor networks on there it'll probably end up on my desk so so speaking of communication when you have the yellow cards take them to the aside and then they will come to a single point of contact down here Hiroshi will be a uh, repeater of tomorrow um, let me go over to, to Henry Henry you are um, you you've been an entrepreneur but you also spend most of your day job uh, in academia where a lot of the best ideas come um, can you talk a little bit about how Internet of Things uh, ideas, concepts, make it from academia to the marketplace and where you think there might be some opportunities? Well, let me maybe answer the almost the opposite question for you, sure. which is what kind of things we do in academia that maybe shouldn't go to the marketplace, um, <laughs> or at least not yet. One of the luxuries we have in academia is to sort of think broadly about these topics, so to really think about the platform plays. And what I've been hearing here from the rest of my panelists is the success really comes from the tightly integrated verticals at least in the market. But the tightly integrated verticals is, is again, as people are talking about these applications, um, you can hear that they are about business processes for the most part. Um, they are about uh, point solutions to very specific problems when they do enter into the consumer space, such as the healthcare. Um, what we like to think about in our lab at some point is sort of turn it on its head, think about it from the consumer's perspective. Um, what could this Internet of Things technology do for consumers? Um, and when you start thinking about that, you think about how you really want some kind of unified platform. You want these products to talk to each other. You want to think through the user interface space. And uh, so then you get all fired up about that, and you start a company, which is what I did in uh, 1998. And you discover through that process that you're way, way early um, for doing a platform play, that this technology isn't anywhere near. So what I think I've learned uh, in the intervening years, even coming through today, is it's still really way too early to do a platform play around this kind of M2M, Internet of Things, as a small entrepreneurial startup company, 
But what I do think is tremendously sort of low-hanging fruit, what is ready to go from sort of concept space into the market, is to think a little bit less about um, the thousands of things that surround us in our lives that we might connect to the net through the Internet of Things, and those tens of things that are already electronic that we can now very affordably add wireless technology to. So typically in these Internet of Things, you know, we're talking about knowing something about every can of soda in the vending machine, potentially. Um, and a very clever solution there is to put the sensors on the, on the <coughs> vending machine so it's more about the machine than about the cans of soda. Okay, and so that's kind of what I would encourage people to do is think about how you can apply technology to the machine and not to the can if we go to that kind of example. <coughs> My company, 12 years ago, we tried to put the technology on the can. And it was way too early for that. And I think it's still too early for that today. So provocative thesis. Mm. Uh, this technology is not ready f to become a platform technology. The rest of the panel want to respond to that? And then we'll go to some of these yellow cards. I'm quite worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think um, you know the way the way we looked at it is is um, I think it will develop into a platform, and what we found is is you you have to find a place to to get this started. So if you look at the reason we have the internet now, and it's funny to see everybody out there twittering away, um, is is because we fundamentally sixty years ago had to keep the nuclear missile silos connected. Um, not a sexy application, not a green application, but it was. Well, where, well, a place that there was a need that we have that, that, that force the development of the technology. And so where we're trying to bring forward, really, we're, we're not trying to design the best um, sensor network for just getting more oil. Um, it's really about how can you get the platform created at a place where the, the impact on the business is large enough um, that, that there is money to be made there, both for the, the user and, and the platform developer. But reality, our eyes are focused on making where this network can have an impact on, on the end user. So, for example, structural health monitoring to watch our aging infrastructure on bridges and buildings, to be able to actually put a seismic network around, um, say, the state of California. If you could get one sensor per square mile, we could be close enough to the epicenter to see the event happen and, and get that information out to people with maybe just 10, 15, 20 seconds worth of warning, but to have a really dramatic impact on, on a, if you could have given the people in Haiti 10 seconds of warning to get out on the streets, you would completely uh, change the impact of that disaster. But unfortunately, we have to start at a place where it makes business sense for, for both the, the, the solution developer and actually the impact on someone's business. And, and so we've seen in, even in the vending model there, there can be, there can be a benefit to, to both people in that equation. So you've you got to find these places to start that actually will get this platform developed. We like to think about if you've got a broad sensing platform, this Internet of Things, there'll be businesses like Google. We don't even know what the business model is going to be built up if, if we do actually get a platform in place um, impacting not just businesses but consumers. One, <clears throat> one thought um, is something that we're actually dealing with is we talk about platforms and you know, I kind of talked about all the different layers we had to build um, out of necessity to make a sale. And you know the platform concept I think makes a lot of sense if you're trying to introduce the Internet of Things kind of uh, business model within an existing industry, whatever niche that is for you. Um, but I think what's going to end up happening over time is that all of a sudden you as the entrepreneur or the startup company or whatever have proven out the payback model and done all the legwork, all of a sudden um, I think what's going to end up happening is that's when the demand for open standards is going to come about. That's when um, different companies are going to come and say, hey, I can do the hardware piece cheaper or I can do the, the software piece cheaper and stuff. And you know, one of the challenges <clears throat> for us and I think anyone who goes into this space is you, know, you spend a lot of time investing in proving the concept out and you have to build all these layers, then you know, uh, how do you defend that platform long term? Or do you? Or do you focus on key components? And I think that's, that's a risk for, uh, I think, this entire space, this whole Internet of Things, which, you know, most of these technologies are off the shelf, right? A lot of the wireless stuff, the modems, all that kind of stuff. Like you mentioned, it, if you're doing hardware, it must be really disruptive, like 10 bucks or something. And uh, so it's really, you know, as an early <laughs> entrepreneur or a company introducing a disruptive platform, um, does your business model accommodate to change and focus on the things that you will add value that no one else can bring and the commodity players come in and replace you with? Or you had a quick comment? I was just saying we have, I would consider, one platform kind of play in the space, which is Jasper, which tries to do the connectivity for 
many of the devices that are out there. I think uh, Cantaloupe uses it. Um, a number of the MDM companies in the, so the metadata management companies in the smart grid space use it. Um, a number of the companies that are doing telematics use it. And, and what they do is that problem that I was talking about before, which is, you know, you have these systems for the carriers and what have you, which are legacy, legacy systems and weren't built to be able to div deliver the solution cheap enough in this space, they do all those sorts of things. And they have to do it in a very different way before because if you're only getting $3 per month for you know, your, your revenue in this case, if you have a, a customer service call, that can like take everything out of the picture. So you have to have a very reliable, very different system to what you had before. And so they have all sorts of analytics and provisioning systems and things to really drive down the cost and, and uh, you know, focus on a different market. And, and I agree also with you know, on, the, on what the panel has said, even if you have a platform, you've got to start somewhere in getting this into the market. And the best thing we see with entrepreneurs is those that iterate and learn from their market, and that's actually how the platform might grow. Yeah, so I, we, we do have a platform, and I, I've been listening to all these things, and I, I think many of the comments about platforms are, are relevant. Um, there's a couple of things that I think are important that I think would apply to what we're doing. The first is what we do from the standpoint of sensors and how we embed sensors is extremely proprietary. And so we started with uh, challenge problems in our company that many established medical device and pharmaceutical uh, companies said would be impossible to solve. And I'll describe two uh, that are probably the most important. One is our ability to package electronics at the wafer scale uh, so that they can survive inside the body for at least 10 years uh, without stopping working so that we can build essentially network medical devices that can go inside the body and we can do that without changing how they go in, how they come out, how the procedure is done, how the doctor interacts with the device or how they get paid. So it's a very seamless technology uh, that um, uh, is very you know, well proven now, uh, partnered with Medtronic which is the world's leading medical device company. It's a challenge problem they worked on for nearly 20 years and couldn't solve. So. That's a, a very important proprietary platform where there are initial uh, clinical applications, but there'll be many over time. On the pharmaceutical side, uh, we kind of do the inverse, which is to have a, um, a sensor that's basically the size of a grain of sand. It's made of edible ingredients that come from the food chain that turn a medicine into a network device. When you swallow it, it turns on. It doesn't use radio signals. It uses your body as a wire. It has a unique conductive mechanism that, again, is proprietary. Um, and our goal here, if we're right, is to essentially get a chip into every pill in the supply chain. And we are doing this because we have extremely high uh, value propositions across a number of dimensions. So there's a clinical value proposition. We can actually make medicine work and make it better and more personalized and deliver uh, a lot of potential that's already there but is unrealizable without more patient uh, control. But we can also dramatically affect development economics, which are the largest driver of cost in the discovery and development uh, piece of the pharmaceutical industry. And we can also create consumer integrity at the pill level. So because we have a digital device inside every, every medicine, if you live in the US, you take for granted the fact that when you go to a pharmacy, your white pill is the white pill the pharmacist says that it is. Uh, if you live in Nigeria, for example, and you have malaria, the trouble you're going to find is that 80% of the pills that you buy are fake. And never mind the cost uh, for the pharma company, that's a lot of dead children. And the ability to have uh, a medicine that you could put, for example, on a phone and have a thumb say yes would be pretty cool. And we can do these things for almost no money. So we make chips that we put in pills for fractions of a penny. We think that's very high value. And we think that's the kind of platform that, that will play and it'll play in, in, in today. I mean, it's, it's here now. Thank you. Let me go to the, some of these yellow cards and then maybe we'll try to go through some of these uh, a little more quickly. Uh, I think this one may be um, uh, perhaps for Henry or, or, or Peter. Uh, physical sensors eliminate the guesswork in, in consumer markets where accessibility is reasonable, such as vending machines. Um, how do you envision the deployment of sensors uh, and their replacements in remote and inaccessible regions, such as for environmental sensing? So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's that's actually one of the big challenges um, that 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 we look at. You know, we uh, we talk about actually our sensors being um, a reusable platform. Um, obviously, power is is a big challenge that, that remains to be solved. I'm we're working towards a unified platform where you won't select a bridge sensor or a seismic sensor or an oil exploration sensor or even the sensor in here to to monitor you know how hot it is up on the lights on the stage. It'll be this kind of unified platform so that if the application ends here, you can collect the sensors, take them, reuse them, redeploy them elsewhere. Um, but it, it is it is one of the challenges um, we're we're looking at, and right now, frankly, it's one of our biggest research things. Um, 
the sensor network that we're doing for oil exploration is, is, is pushing close to a million nodes. And just physically actually getting them to the desert is, is a logistics problem and then putting them out there and recovering them to, to make sure there's not environmental impact. It's actually one of the main thrusts of our, of our, techno of our research actually in how to solve this problem. So, so well, some of the stuff we've done in the lab along these lines is to understand that that sensor data doesn't always need to be collected in real time. And so there's some techniques you can use to collect the data periodically. One is when satellites fly overhead. That's a relatively expensive one, but for the most remote sensors. But then also we've uh, done some things like equipping buses in rural India with Wi-Fi hotspots. So as they drive around, um, data can be delivered and data can be picked up. So very affordably and inexpensively. That's cool. All right, so maybe I'll address this to a nun first in specific, and then maybe uh, uh, Warren more generally. What can you charge for sensor-based analytics, particularly if these analytics can be used to target relevant you know, advertising, but for other applications as well? Um, that's a good question that we are facing right now. Um, the analytics that we provide today with the data that we collect is really just routing efficiencies. Um, but then, like I talked about earlier, uh, merchandising and you know, stuff that will actually impact the consumer, we won't know until <clears throat> we get it out there, we kind of see what the sales lift will be like, and then you hope to charge something just slightly less than that. Um, but, you know, the, the question is, can we prove out that the, using that information analytically will uh, create value for our clients? I don't know if I answered that concretely. How much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> we charge $6 a month. Uh, but that includes everything. Uh, that includes uh, paying Jasper's bill and um, using Are our paying software Warren? service, paying Warren, <laughs> uh, and and it's 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 the whole kit and caboodle um, for us right now. Warren, more generally, analytics opportunity. I mean, it, it all depends on the application, the value you're delivering to the consumer. If it's data that they don't already have, I mean, you can do value-based pricing. So it all depends on the application. Yeah, that's what I think. Consistent with what Anand just said. Uh, Peter, you're a MEMS guy. What will be the most successful products in MEMS NEMS uh, that will be enabled in the next 10 years? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, Chem biosensing. Um, I think without a doubt that, that, uh, that look at the impact of us being able to, to tell what is moving around us um, based on on its potential impact to us. So it's the what molecules are is it giving off. It's simple for us to think about airport um, security, where right now we're really just, it's a wipe test if you get unlucky to see if there's nitrates or you've been on a farm today and hopefully not. Um, bringing something in your luggage in the airport, what you really want to know is everybody who comes onto that airport property um, to basically be able to, to just to sniff for what they're leaving off. A closer to home impact though would be around um, the food uh, distribution system, right? We've seen these food recalls in the last few years, uh, especially here in the U.S. Um, you know, contaminated lettuce gets to 29 states before we even figure out there's a problem. There's probably only three bad bags of lettuce out there. We don't even know where they came from. We destroy millions of pounds of lettuce. Um, the waste and the impact on that on our system is just something we need to have chem, chem biosensing, looking for contaminants, looking for our things still organic, looking for uh, bacteria. Um, um, to, to all the way back to where the food chain started for a, by the time it leaves the field, monitoring all the way up to my refrigerator, um, which, you know, definitely I, I need the fridge to tell me those leftovers are too old in there and, and need to go out. So. Andrew, I don't suppose you actually agree that biosensing is an important application, do you? Uh, could be. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I ask a, can I ask a question back there? In, in your discussions with companies about those applications, I mean, the question is who's going to pay now, I think that, you know, that's, that's e exactly uh, the right question to ask. And so where we've started is in developing the system and pushing the research forward, it's, it's a place where the impact on the business at that end, like you called it, just value pricing, right? So the impacts on, on lessening the environmental impact of oil exploration and getting a few more percent recovered from a field, so enormous relative to what it's cost to develop this system. And the hope is that through the integration and the push and, and looking at, at these creative ways to deploy things that you can get down to where, where we need to do this as a society to have this impact, to understand our water, to understand seismic monitoring, to avoid these disasters. So we're not reactively paying bills afterwards. We can, we can instead preventively do these things. 
So what you have to do is get the technology there, and it's going to take uh, an economic impact to, 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 to push towards that. So somewhere in that, in that chain, hopefully the, the essentials will be free, and then, then we'll all know <laughs> why it's the food supply. Um, and it'll be the data in the end that people will be thankful for. Actually, another question came in which is related to that, which is, you know, in some cases, the societal benefit is a purchase because the government goes ahead and, and, and uh, you know, purchases certain things. So, um, you know, let me ask this of the panel. Uh, what are the other opportunities that are government applications of Internet of Things? Well, so we are not... Um executing this yet, but we will be, um, there's clearly significant military applications for the technologies that we are uh, developing. So uh, we have a significant amount of intellectual property that relates to how you use our systems for war fighters, uh, and uh, that, that is a significant area of opportunity. And you could think about that across the entire uh, military. Um, and you might think about replacing the mobile phone with a, with a you know, a, a military radio, but I mean, you basically have something that enables you to know military status, whereabouts, um, health. Um, you could think about using it for uh, protection against toxins. There's a lot of lot of applications in the military domain. What about non-defense applications? Anyone on the panel? Um, we looked at something early on, which was just, I mean, not as big as these other applications, which is parking meters. Uh, and uh, what I what we found was was surprising was like. We, the city of San Francisco loses money in the metering business. Uh, you, if, if you've gotten a ticket, it's kind of hard to believe, but they do. They actually lose money on that business. Um, and uh, so, you know, we just looked at can you connect them, um, can you tell the meter maid exactly which meter to hit at any given moment rather than just going from block to block to block. Um, it's a very simple application. Um, and there's solutions now out there that cities are looking at, so that was kind of low-hanging fruit in our opinion. Um. Also, uh, in terms of the analytics side, there's a number of people who are working on churning through all the data these sensors are putting out to understand the spread of disease, try and head off the next pandemic, um, get uh, you know better control of uh, overall societal health. Great. Let me just bring up another question that a lot of people have, which is, uh, around privacy. Uh, comments? <laughs> Can I ask the audience a question? I'm sorry? Can I ask the audience a question? How many people in this audience use a credit card? <laughs> okay, how many of you search on Google? I think you have the answer to the privacy question. <laughs> all these. Um, no, no, but all, all of you, all of you, all of you have sold yet, your privacy. Yet. You've all sold your privacy, and you've done so for a value proposition, which in the case of a credit card is purchasing convenience, and in the case of Google is the access to information. And so um, privacy is a very, very important issue, but what we've learned about uh, uh, large populations and their behavior is that, that there's these big concerns about privacy, liability, and security. And in America in particular, they're balanced by the desire for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and those three things trump if you deliver the right value proposition. And the that's, the key, that's the key for businesses so, to... So, you know, in the spirit of two wrongs, don't make a right. Yeah. Just because people <laughs> don't understand all of the ways they've given up personal mm -hmm. privacy yeah. um, doesn't mean that as we introduce new technologies, we shouldn't try and think through ways that those technologies can go out perhaps in privacy-friendly ways as opposed to privacy-destructive ways. No, I absolutely agree. So I think agree. we're, you know, at the, in the, those of us who are in the driver's seat mm -hmm. should be very aware of the topic and, and think through friendlier but, solutions. But, but at an individual consumer level, I think this is really important, um, I have never had a problem with my credit card. Some people do, and there are privacy or um, security layers that you can put in for, for, for theft of um, identity, which are all very, very appropriate. And the point I'm making is that these aren't serious issues. It's that there is this idea that um, I think created very largely by sort of the center that says, okay, privacy is a very big issue. And I think people are appropriately concerned in healthcare, for example, about uh, healthcare institutions um, sharing their data with somebody else, right? But uh, most people, if you look at what's going on on the internet, are happy if they want to, to share their own private healthcare information with others. And you look at patients like me and other sites, it's going on all the time. So this privacy issue is one where I think we have to be fairly moderated about uh, the fact that it needs to be taken seriously, it has to be uh, managed very appropriately, but what we know is that most people, if they're offered a real benefit, are willing to uh, 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 compromise at a certain level their, their personal privacy. And so I think it's, it's just, it's clear, and, and behavior supports that, that notion. 
So I think I, I think there's there's a lot of places though where where if you can you can get the data um, anonymously and it can still have an enormous value. So in in the vending situation, you want to know that the machine is out of peanut M and M's. The machine may also know that Pete buys peanut M and M's. I don't want my doctor to know I eat a bag of peanut M and M's every day. <laughs> the the, the the, and the, but but HP's insurance provider may actually want to know that that everybody on site eats a lot of peanut M and M's every day. That that you know. So at what level do you associate me and the peanut M and M's? And that's where the safeguards and privacy is is something that that I think, as you said, it's it's as stewards of bringing this new technology forward, we need to think through these problems before before there's no going back. I think there's also an interesting difference between the two examples you you cited. One, who uses a credit card, mm -hmm. two, who uses Google. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the credit card, there's a rich set of law that's out there to yep. protect credit card users and try to control what happens with the data yep. that comes out of it. In the case of Google, uh, there's very little law, if any, that controls what data, uh, mm -hmm. what Google might do with your mm -hmm. search yeah. history. Um, <laughs> we might give some thought to as a society if we want to have stronger data privacy laws as Europe does for example, yeah. um, and that's a completely non-technical issue, uh, but it's, it's one yep. I think worth um, thinking about is that um, you don't want to, you have to be very careful when it gets into the legislative space. I, I worked with Massachusetts State Senate on laws around RFID and privacy, and what's really important is you don't regulate um, the technology because you'll stifle innovation, mm -hmm. but rather you regulate what's done with the data the technology gathers. Okay, and there's a key difference there. And in some ways, while the legislation is in general way behind the technology, they could actually jump out ahead if they just look at it from a data protection point of view mm -hmm. and forget about the actual mm -hmm. Internet of Things way that the data will be collected. All right, and we'll return to the privacy versus privacy debate <laughs> soon. <laughs> and, now, and now it's time for, for those of you who are Jim Cramer fans, the lightning round. You must answer very, very quickly each of these questions. Uh, one at a time, we'll start in a nut. Uh, everyone answer the same questions. What will be the next n big n uh, n modality for wireless sensors beyond acceleration, temperature, sound pressure, et cetera? What's going to be sensed? Uh, solar, uh, harvesting light better. Uh, eating, drinking, and making merry. <laughs> I actually don't have. It's up to you guys. I, I already had the long answer. It's Chem Biosense. Uh, smell. Which net? Uh, <laughs> which Internet of, <laughs> Internet of Things application will be the basis it's of the, the first billion-dollar business? Vending. <laughs> you had to think about it. Uh, I agree with Anand. <laughs> I think you've already seen it in the uh, um, smart grid space. Peter. We're betting on oil exploration. <laughs> Vending. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's three votes right. there. That's pretty good. Uh, which is the bigger Internet of Things opportunity, B2B or B2C? B2B. 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 Right now, B2B. C2C in the end. Oh. oh. <laughs> nice. That's another panel discussion. What's the biggest barrier to Internet of Things becoming a huge business? Commoditization. Regulation. Has to rhyme. Pass. Power supply, batteries. Ooh. Time, it'll happen. <laughs> What's the most critical talent issue for an Internet of Things company? Talent issue? Yeah. Um, Hiring. Hiring. <laughs> Uh, that was a question, not the answer. Edu educating the clients on the value proposition. Um, yeah, I think edu educating customers. Very similar. Understanding the vertical that you're in. Yeah, talking someone who can actually talk, get your customers to talk. Focus. <laughs> Biggest fear in the space? Commoditization. <laughs> um, time. How long it's going to take? No fears. <laughs> uh, security of the data. Security. Of the, don't don't yeah. making sure the data doesn't get spoofed by somebody along the way. Privacy. <laughs> and what excites you most about the space? Uh, the disruptive fact of it. Uh, ability to make huge global impact. Just thousands of applications. This is going to be bigger than the internet. Humanization of technology. 
vending. Thank you all. Thank really you. appreciate it. <laughs>